Day 240 of the Ukrainian War Map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian War. Juzzy here, and today is a, another quick update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine today. And as always, I like to start off with some of those Russian military losses. So as of the 21st of the 10th uh, of, of October 2022, so we are dealing with an additional 100 or so losses, Russian military personnel losses, which is indeed lower than the average amount you, you, you do find. And then when we have a look at the Russian hardware losses, again, a little bit less than average, or actually somewhat less than average today. So three armored combat vehicle losses, six tank losses but hey that's that's still a decent amount of tanks considering Russia could only theoretically produce three a month so six a day is it's quite nice and uh, artillery two there as well now we'll jump back across to the map and we'll start out in uh, Moscow where a military equipment base near Moscow is on fire uh, some suggested it was reportedly hit by Ukraine I'm not yet convinced of this, as it's so deep within Russian territory. To me, it's more likely a very particular ineptitude uh, that Russia has with safety practices and safety execution regarding the safe storage of munitions. And it wouldn't be the first time, uh, for sh that's for sure. Then we move across to Belgorod, so still part of the Russian Federation there, just on the border to Ukraine, where missile launches were reported in Belgorod there. And around the same time of that news, there were multiple missile strikes reported in the adjacent Kharkiv Oblast there, just across the border where five people were wounded as a result of those Russian missile strikes and an industrial building was hit there as well. Then we move across to the Donbass where the main artillery jewels location would particularly be the, the Crimina area at the moment. Goes all the way up on the highway to Svartove. So certainly some fierce fight in here. Probably the main point here to say right now is that the Ukrainian forces are well within just a standard artillery range there, which leads them to their encirclement campaigns that uh, eventually take out any given destination or target that they want to. Then we'll move back across a bit further down to the Bakhmut front line, where an empty playground was hit. And this is just inhumane, indiscriminate shelling, really. But then again, are we surprised? Russian forces are using artillery w weapons with tubes or barrels that have been largely worn out and not being maintained or repaired, thus making for a particularly inaccurate piece of weaponry. There's countless intercepted Russian calls now showing that Russians shoot from these batteries hoping for the best, whilst at the same time they're completely surprised by the impeccable precision of the opposing Ukrainian uh, artillery shots. Oh, and one step further, Russian lines are rife with friendly fire artillery issues. That is to say they hit themselves sometimes, doing the job for the, the Ukrainians instead. But back to Bakhmut, uh, the Ukrainian armed forces have been repelling wave upon wave of frontline attacks still in uh, Bakhmut, but also nearby Solodar as well, where fighting remains its heaviest in these regions here. But the question remains, what happens if Russia hypothetically took Bakhmut? Well, objectively, I'd say it's one settlement that would have taken over six months to capture out of a remaining 600 to take in the remainder of the Donbass. So if you want to extrapolate out even, say, 10 settlements taken by Russia every six months, you're looking at about, uh, what's that, 60 by 0.5, about 30 years at this rate for Russia to have... Uh, to, to, to take the rest of the Donbass, effectively. And even if, even if they did take it, I'm 
fairly certain they would have a little bit of uh, a, a feeling of self-defeated or some type of buyer's remorse because they'd objectively then start to look back at their quote-unquote success and then realize it took them half a year with countless losses to hardware and life to do so, leading itself to be not a sustainable approach just for taking one spot on the map. And then also in the wider Donbass, actually this is in the the sub area, you could call it Luhansk, a Russian T-72 B3 uh, 2016 model tank was captured in good condition there. So that's always fantastic. Oh, and also in the uh, this region, there's also a quick pick of uh, an example uh, of a middle of the night delivery run for the Ukrainian armed forces. Some additional bits and pieces of equipment, armor, medipacks, things of that nature there. Uh, with this one in particular, there was all these uh, torches and things at night. So they did have to, in fact, move their location right after receiving these goods, just so they wouldn't identify their geo position into the, uh, the Russian forces on the other side. Then we'll move across down to Zaporizhia. This is the city in particular. Uh, where the Russian army conducted missile strikes against this location again. Not a lot of information on today's strike so far, but it's very likely to have been at least pointed towards the, the power infrastructure in this region, which is something that Russia is into at the moment. They want to take out the, the civilian infrastructure, really, which is uh, because they're not doing so great on the front line, they're looking to attack the rear, essentially. Then we'll move across to the Kherson region where things are certainly heating up, but perhaps not in the way that you would expect. So a lot of reports are now suggesting that it appears Russian professional soldiers are pulling back from the front lines of the Kherson Oblast and being replaced with about 2,000 new recruits instead. So this is likely the extent to which a Russian withdrawal will go. Very possibly using thousands of their own as cannon fodder to hold the front line temporarily as the remaining more valued forces make for an exit. And this is all against the backdrop of forced civilian relocation to the other side of the river, closer to Russia and the Russian-occupied territories. And combat or compound all of that with some reports indicating that Russia has rigged up the dam with explosives. And this is at the Kakovka Hydroelectric Power Plant Dam Bridge right over here for a large dam explosion, uh, for which the, the Russian forces would likely feel gives them some sort of a getaway advantage. Also a saving face mechanism or advantage as well, where Russia would then just blame Ukraine for the dam explosion and overflow at the same time. But there is no benefit or need for the Ukrainian armed forces to do this. Ukraine has performed high precision strikes on the road and the rail supply lines leading up to the dam uh, about 20 plus times now at least with high precision HIMARS strikes. So all Ukraine needed to do was stop Russia from traversing this dam bridge and they achieved that quite well. So Russia would be looking to potentially set up some sort of a false flag attack here, but the world would very much see through it at this point. Uh, also in this region, Russian forces uh, have been known to continue to use CS gas grenades, also commonly known as tear gas, on the curse on front lines on Ukrainian use, uh, units. It's a dirty tactic that causes tearing of the eyes to the extent that you usually cannot see and a burning irritation on the mucous membranes of, of say the, the nose, the mouth and the throat choking you up a bit. It will partially incapacitate the subject for a time.
And it's a bit of a dick move because its use in warfare is prohibited by various international treaties and protocols like the Geneva Protocol, as it's considered a, a banned chemical weapon. But, you know, that's our Putin. Also, there was some satellite footage on the Dnipro River here where Russian forces evacuated military equipment out of the Kherson North Bank very recently too. It's very difficult to get this equipment over to the north side of the bank safely in the first place, and now they're taking it back. It gives you an idea pretty much of what's to come. Then we'll move across to some news, starting out with Amnesty International that says Russian attacks on critical energy infrastructure amount to war crimes. Now, this we already know. However, the CEO of a Ukrainian energy company said that Russia can never completely destroy the power infrastructure because they mostly only have the capability to destroy power hubs and not the power generating uh, locations themselves. Having said all of that, winter is coming and Ukraine and Russia will still both be affected by this. So the international community still does need to come together and assist Ukraine in any way they can, whether it be power generators or, or some different type of technology, something interim. But um, yeah, the, the assistance does still need to happen on that front, absolutely. And then in some more news, the uh, sorry, Ukrainian president Z Zelensky uh, said that Ukraine didn't order the Crimean bridge attack. So he was speaking with a Canadian CTV uh, news outlet and he said that Ukraine didn't actually order that hit and that Russian domestic conflicts could have caused the explosion. Effectively, certain Russian slowing down the war effort and saving their own lives in the process because the explosion had severed Russia's well, really Russia's only southern supply line route for this war. And in some other news here, Ukrainians have opened almost 10,000 businesses in Poland since the beginning of the war. So some stats are showing that almost every 10th new business in Poland is owned by Ukrainians. And most of those businesses are in industries where Poland is facing labor shortages. So pretty neat stuff there. And then in some further news, the uh, German Chancellor Scholz announced that Germany is ramping up their efforts to train an additional 5,000 Ukrainian soldiers by spring as part of the ongoing military assistance uh, mission in support of Ukraine. Oh, and this is my favorite file photo of Scholz. It, it never gets old for me. <laughs> And then in some other news, multiple news reports now suggest that Iranian drone instructors are in Crimea training Russian forces to bomb Ukraine areas with the loitering munition drones or the kamikaze drones. Whilst at the same time, Iran is denying even sending the kamikaze drones to Russia in the first place. Now, since Ukraine has been shooting down one too many of these things, this small Iranian training convoy hopes to better teach Russia how to use the drones. But many of the supplied drones are the Shahid 136s. And they have, these ones in particular, have so few and so limited sensors on them that I'm not convinced it will yield any additional uh, amazing results for Russia. And in some other news, Mark Hamill, who played Luke Skywalker is uh, in the Star Wars film franchise, will provide 500 drones to the Ukrainian army as part of a recent fundraising campaign. So may the force be with AFU. And then in some really, really recent fresh news, Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shogu held a telephone conversation with the US Secretary of Defense uh, the, the Russian Defense Ministry said, 
The parties discussed the situation in Ukraine and international security, and both parties stressed the need to keep channels of communication open in the context of the war in Ukraine. And in another mobilization blunder, we have yet another video of a recently mobilized and disgruntled Russian soldier. He creates some footage here with his uh, voiceover saying that he's received cheap kids plastic paintball masks that offer no real protection, children's uh, sized tactical gloves, and they didn't fit a single fighter that tried them on. He's very upset with the shoes as well. He goes on about them for <laughs> quite a bit it seems. And he voices upset at the Stavropol administration, which is the, the Russian crew that mobilized and provided him the gear. But almost not a day goes by without a Russian mobilization blunder, and I hope to bring more to you all the time. <laughs> and just lastly, a bit of a, a funny to round it all off with. The <laughs> The machine-loving Russian forces, machine, uh, washing machine-loving Russian forces, can't say my words, are at it again. So, due to increasing reports of Russians evacuating some frontline areas such as Kherson and Enohoda in the south, a Ukrainian drone took this footage of two Russian soldiers looting a house for, you guessed it, a washing machine. Now, if I had to guess, I would say this one looks like the front loader variant, which is said to provide a, a more thorough clean, whilst at the same time being more gentle on your clothes as well. Due to the missing washing agitator mechanism, uh, normally associated with the top loader variants instead. So it was a good choice for Ivan and Sergey, I think. Okay guys, I'm going to leave it at that for now. Thanks for watching. Please leave a comment, subscribe, hit that like button, and I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.